There we go. Yeah. So how many field seasons did you get to do in the Galapagos? I've been going every year since 2013. So wow. eight, seven, eight. <laughs> and I went twice in one year. Um, with my colleague, uh, Sarah Canuti, my collaborator, we went on a scouting trip uh, in November in 2018, I think. So I got to go twice that year, which was really cool. Yeah, that's crazy. Is it as cool as it is hyped up to be? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, in my department at some point, um, like a lot of people in my department, and especially on the conservation side, they work on places like Borneo, you know, in Indonesia and stuff. And I'm like, Oh, I'm so jealous. I, and they go, Kyoko, you work in the Galapagos. You don't get to say anything. I'm like, oh, okay, sorry. You're right. I'm very, very lucky. But yeah, no, it's really, it, I, I'm nowhere. I don't think it's possible to get tired of going back there. By any yeah. Means. Oh, man. That's so cool. So is it, it's kind of a long-term, I guess you'll reveal this in your talk, but it's kind of a long-term study site set up or? Yeah. So, um, with my collaborators, we've got a long-term sort of um, go every year and collect data type thing. And then what I've been doing for the past several years is I go down with a different question each time and try, hopefully, because <laughs> uh, of this field work, um, try and get, um, try and answer that question. Um, as with anything, every time you go down there and answer a question, it inevitably leads to more questions. And so then it, it's like, oh, well, I, I got to go back down there to answer that question. Oh, darn. Yeah. <laughs> The never ending cycle. Hopefully, yeah. never ending cycle. <laughs> um, I guess this year is would have been much different then, right? Is this the first year you haven't gone in? No. So I will um, mention it at the very, very end, but I did go down um, for a field season this year, but it was oh, cut short. Okay. okay. Yeah. I guess, is there summer and winter flip tarts? No, it's right on the equator. So okay. it's sort of in between so the falls it's probably closer to a north american system because in the fall when we went in november uh, my colleague and i were quite surprised because we needed a long sleeve jacket in the evenings and we were wearing our jeans and and when we come normally in february march it's much too hot for that so okay. so there is seasonality but it's because it's equatorial it's it's pretty consistent mm -hmm. okay Wow. And where's your field work? Um, it is, um, sometimes I open up R, uh, other times I open up ArcGIS, and uh, I can really go anywhere between those two programs. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I do more, more macroecology type of work, so I can't. Okay. Um, I, I've done some field seasons back in undergrad um, and helped out with some field seasons. Um, I'll often tag along with some lab mates to do whole field work. Um, but so far in my PhD, I haven't been able to, to do a full field season on my own. Okay. But it's it's okay. I, uh, I enjoy the work in R and ArcGIS, so. Fantastic. Yeah. And I make up for it with conferences. So that's the, the other side. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. So which conferences are, uh, are you particularly fond of? Um, well, CSEE obviously is uh, the favorite. That was the second conference I ever went to actually was CSEE in Victoria. Um, so it's very near and dear to my heart, obviously. Um, terrific conference for anyone tuning in that hasn't been to a CSEE conference, I highly recommend it. Um, but uh, last year I was at the Species on the Move conference, um, which was in Kruger National Park in South Africa. <gasps> Um, yeah, it was it was incredible. They had set up the whole conference to be basically, you know, you woke up in the morning, did a morning safari, came back in time for the coffee and talks, did the talks all day, and they ended just in time for the sunset safari, so you could go out and do that and come back. It was excellent programming. <laughs> it sounds fantastic. Um, do you have any favorites as well? CSEE, um, yes, is one of my uh, favorite ones. Um, I'm quite partial to the um, Behavioral Ecology um, Quebec Conference, SQEBC. 
Mm -hmm. uh, cause that was my first conference and it's just a great environment. I just really uh, enjoy the um, friendliness and the camaraderie in, in that much like CSEE. Mm -hmm. And then um, evolution is always fun. Uh, I've always uh, usually have a really good time. Was in Rhode Island last year and was supposed to be okay. in Cleveland this year. But yeah. um, that one's always a really fun one for me as well. Were you at the joint one in Montpellier, was it? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that I was a lot was, of fun. Yeah. It was, um, I mean, it was a fantastic setting. It was fantastic science. The only downside was the poster sessions. It depended on what room you ended up in and it was extremely hot. So when I presented my poster, I ended up being on the top floor and it was like a greenhouse basically. And so we were sitting there waiting for the session to start and we're all just kind of like, are you just sort of dripping sweat? Yes, okay, <laughs> we're just gonna have to go through this for the next two hours. So that was the only downside of that, but it was uh, it was a lot of fun, uh, fantastic plenaries, and and um, uh, and it's a beautiful city. So, mm -hmm. awesome. All right, well, it is four oh one Eastern Daylight Time, so I think we'll get started. It looks like people are filtering into the video, um, so I'll start off with just a little housekeeping. First of all, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for tuning in to the. Canadian Society for Ecology and Evolution's second and final Early Career Award talk. Uh, we have today Dr. Kyoko Gatanda, who will be giving a talk on uh, human influences on adaptation in the Galapagos Islands. I am super excited to hear it. Uh, I hope you're just as excited um, to hear her present. Um, we had a great talk last week as well. Um, I'm sure this will be just as incredible. Um, as a reminder, if you're tuning in, and at any point, if you have questions for Dr. Gatanda, you can type them into the chat box um, on the, just below the stream. Um, you can type those in at any point. You can type them in at the end of the chat uh, or at the end of the talk. And at the end of the talk, I will uh, relay those questions to um, Kyoko. And so we'll have a live question period. Um, other than that, um, thank you again for tuning in. Um, and without further ado, I will pass it on to Dr. Gatendo. Thank you, Peter, for that. Um, thank you all for coming. And I would like to start by thanking the Canadian Society for Ecology and Evolution for this award. I'm very humbled to receive it. And I'd also like to extend my congratulations to my co-awardee and friend, Diana Renison, who gave a fantastic talk last week. And if you haven't seen her talk yet, I'd say just leave this one and go watch hers instead. It's really good. So broadly, my research has become more and more focused on understanding human influences on adaptation and evolution. And so to do that, I'm going to take you to some work, uh, take you to the Galapagos Islands where I've been doing some of my recent work. So the Galapagos Islands are an island archipelago located about a thousand kilometers off the coast of Ecuador. And this is where young Charles Darwin visited. And it, this place was one of the places that helped to inspire him to ultimately develop his theory of evolution. Now, Charles Darwin traveled around on the HMS Beagle, which is uh, illustrated here. And it was a voyage that lasted for um, over almost five, five or six years. And it took him around the world. And he chronicled his travels in uh, a book appropriately titled, appropriately titled The Voyage of the Beagle. And at my department at Cambridge, we have a first edition of the book. And so I was really excited. I got to convince the librarian to pull it out for me and so I could look through the plates and it was really, really cool. So in The Voyage of the Beagle, Darwin talks about some of the things that he did as a naturalist. And on the Galapagos Islands, what this entailed was doing things like riding giant tortoises, and taking marine iguanas and picking them up and throwing them in the water. And then they'd swim back to him and he'd pick them up and he'd throw them in the water again. And he was just like, this is absolutely fascinating. So we are not allowed to do any of those kinds of things anymore. Now the Galapagos Islands are also known for the Darwin's finches. The Darwin's finches are an example of an adaptive radiation where several species of finches have evolved from a common ancestor. So each species has a different size and shaped beak, and this allows them to exploit different ecological niches. And so what this means is there's a tight link between the size and shape of the beak of the finch and the types of foods they eat. 
So what you're looking at on the left here are the ground finches. So you have your small, medium, and large ground finch and your cactus finch on the bottom. And on the right, you can see the different types of food items they, have to, they can exploit. So the small ground finch can exploit the small seeds, but these seeds are too small for the large ground finch to be able to manipulate in their larger beak. Conversely, the large ground finch can exploit larger seeds, but the small ground finch lacks the size and the strength to be able to exploit these. On the bottom, you have your cactus finch, which has a very long, thin beak, and this allows it to get to the center of the cactus flowers. So the types of food that the Darwin finches eat is tightly linked to their beak size and shape. Now, the Galapagos Islands' primary industry is tourism. So the infrastructure and permanent human population exist on the islands to support this industry. And so on the left in blue are the number of permanent human residents on the islands, and on the right are in orange are the number of visitors. And what you can see is in the past 40 to 50 years, there's been an exponential increase in the number of visitors or tourists and the number of permanent residents. These data only go to 2010. The numbers from 2018, I was told are 280,000 visitors visited the Galapagos in 2018 and the permanent human resident population is at 30,000. So these permanent residents are distributed across four islands uh, on the Galapagos. And these photos are from the largest town, Puerto Ayora, on the island of Santa Cruz. And you can see the associated infrastructure that supports the permanent human population. Restaurants, roads, trucks, hotels, bars, clubs, et cetera, they are all now on the Galapagos. So we humans are now a permanent part of the Galapagos Islands. And so I'm interested in how we humans could be affecting the Darwin's finches. So I'll be asking three questions related to the different types of human influences on the Galapagos. And so my first question is, do finches prefer human foods? So this work has been done in collaboration with Diana Sharp, Jaime Chavez, Luis de Leon, Jeff Podos, Andrew Hendry, and Yost Raymaker. And so I want, want to remind you again that there's that link between the size and shape of the beak of the finch and the types of food that they exploit. Now the problem is, is that we humans cannot consume these types of finch food, basically. So what we've done is we've brought in our own types of foods. Now, the important thing about this is that it doesn't matter what size or shape beak you have to be able to consume human foods. A cactus finch, a large ground finch, a small ground finch, they can all consume popcorn, bread, rice, or other types of human foods. We also know that the Darwin's finches feed on human foods. And so this is a cheeky little finch that is eating right out of a breakfast bowl, some breakfast cereal. And we know that this consumption of human foods is potentially changing the size and shape of the beak. But what we don't know is if Darwin's finches actually prefer human foods to the foods that they're supposed to be eating. So we conducted an, a cafeteria style experiment where we presented the finches with both human foods and the types of foods that they were supposed to be eating. And so this video is from one of our trials in town. And you can see they come to the tray, they're consuming food in the tray. The question is, are they consuming the human foods or the foods they're supposed to be eating. And they can actually get quite aggressive in these trials with each other. So we did these experiments at three different sites. The first site was a, uh, where researchers go, but there are no tourists and no presence of human food. So this is our re remote site. We did, a, we did some trials at the beach. So this beach is about 12 kilometers away from town, but a large number of tourists and locals go there and they have picnics. So there's an abundance of human foods there. And then we also conducted the experiment in town where you have urban infrastructure as well as human foods. And so what we did was we quantified the amount of food eaten. So on the Y axis, you have the amount of food consumed and there's a plot for each of the three sites and the foods are divided on the left. You have your human food. So you have crisp biscuits and rice and since Probably many of you are Canadian or American. That translates to potato chips, cookies, and rice. And then on the right, you have your um, foods that they're supposed to be eating. And so we have a plot for each site. And what we found was that at the site with no humans, that in general, the finches didn't come to the trials. And when they did, they didn't exhibit a preference for either type of food. However, on the beach, what you can see is that the finches preferentially consumed the human foods. And in this particular case, they particularly like the biscuits or the cookies. 
And in town, we have the same results, where the finches, when presented with both types of food, preferentially consumed the human foods as opposed to the foods that they're supposed to be eating. So this might help to explain how humans and the presence of human foods might be affecting things such as beak shape and size in the finches. So do finches prefer human foods? Yes, they do. And as always, this leads to even more questions, such as, well, why do they prefer the human foods? And what are the potential consequences? So in terms of why do Darwin's finches prefer human foods, I asked the question, do Darwin's finches have taste preferences? Because we know that birds have taste receptors and can differentiate between different tastes. So this is work done in collaboration with my undergraduate, David Lever, as well as Rose Thorogood at the University of Helsinki and Louise Rush at Laurentian University. And so what we did is we did a cafeteria style experiment again, but this time what we used was we used a neutral pastry and then we flavored this pastry in relation to different types of tastes associated with human foods. So we had salty pastry to represent potato chips or crisps, sweet to represent the biscuits or cookies. And then we also had a, an oily one in case there was a grease component perhaps that they like since uh, so many uh, humans, we like our uh, fried foods. And then we also had a bitter pastry as well. And so we associated each taste with a different color cup and you can see our extremely high tech scientific equipment which are um, plastic Easter eggs from the dollar store. And we filled each different colored cup with a different flavor. And this time, instead of quantifying the amount consumed, what we did was we filmed the trials and we quantified the number of times a finch actually fed from a particular colored cup. So when it stuck its head into the cup, consumed a piece of food and brought its head up again. And what we did was we compared the taste preferences to the neutral pastry with the expectation that the finches would not prefer the bitter uh, foods in either site and that in town we would expect that the finches might have a preference for sweet and salty foods which are the foods that are preferentially consumed. What we were curious about was what we would find at the remote site in terms of sweet and salty if finches that don't have exposure to human foods have a propensity for these sweet or salty foods. And so what you're looking at is the comparison with the amount of neutral pastry consumed. So in the black, you have your means and your bars are your confidence intervals. And then the gray areas are histograms. So if you wanna get a, a sense of what the distribution of your data is, just turn your head like this or whichever direction it is. And so what you can see is that for the bitter taste, surprisingly, that the bitter taste was preferred compared to the neutral and to the other flavors, which was quite interesting. And then that the other flavors, there was no particular preference for them. And this is at a remote site. And then in town, we found that there was no preference for any particular types of taste in town, including a non-aversion to the bitter foods, to the bitter taste as well. Now, we're not quite sure why we have these results or how to interpret them. So if you have any suggestions or would like to discuss this, I will be happy to talk about this uh, with you at the end of the talk. So in terms of trying to parse out why finches prefer human foods, when it comes to taste preferences, it appears that we don't have any evidence for that. So the consequences of what happens when you prefer human foods. So it was another question that comes up. And so I asked the question, do different diets affect the gut microbiome? And this was done in collaboration with Sarah Canuti and Jaime Chavez. And Sarah and I came up with a non-lethal, um, non-invasive method to collect fecal samples from the finches to be able to analyze their microbiome. And we affectionately call it the poop machine. And I have a colleague who has a nickname for it called the crap traption. And so if you use it and come up with a fancy fun name for it, please let us know so that we can uh, continue to uh, spread the word of all these great nicknames for our poop machine. And so what we did was we quantified bacterial diversity of the gut microbiome in three different sites. We had one site where there's no presence of humans and no presence of human foods. We have one site where there's a presence of humans in terms of foot traffic, but there's no human foods. And then we have a site where there is both the presence of humans and human foods. We looked at two different species, the medium and the small ground finch. And what we expected is that the two sites with no human foods, that there would be a difference in bacterial diversity because of the different types of foods that they're consuming. And then at the site with the human foods, where they were both feeding on the same types of food, human foods basically, we would expect to see a convergence in the diversity between the two species. And what we found was that at the site with no human foods, there is a difference between the two species, though it was only statistically significant at one site. 
But what we found at the site with human foods is that there was a difference between the two species as well. And when you look at the difference in bacterial gut diversity, gut bacterial diversity within a species, you can also see that their um, microbiome has changed in relation to human foods. So human foods are changing the bacterial diversity in the gut microbiome, but we're just not quite sure how it's doing that, nor are we quite sure what the consequences of this are. So we're continuing research doing things such as li linking this to immune function. And so hopefully uh, we'll soon have some more results for you regarding this. But when it comes to the question of do different diets affect the microbiome, yes, it does appear that the presence of human foods and the consumption of human foods in finches changes the gut microbiome. So the next thing that I'd like to talk about is invasive predators. So I was talking to you about the introduction of human foods. That's not the only thing that we humans have introduced on the Galapagos Islands. And so my question is, do finches behaviorally respond to invasive predators? And this is because we've introduced mammalian house cats and rats to the islands. And this is of particular importance because as Charles Darwin noted in his Voyage of the Beagle, all of the terrestrial birds are often approached sufficiently near to be killed with a switch and sometimes, as I myself tried, with a cap or a hat. We are not allowed to do that anymore either. But what this, this indicates is that these birds have had an evolutionarily uh, naive, uh, ex are, are evolutionarily naive to exposure to mammalian predators, which can have lethal consequences. So to do this, I quantified anti-predator behavior among islands that vary in the presence or absence of invasive predators. So on four of the islands, we have the presence of cats and rats, and on two islands, they are pristine. So there's no history whatsoever of introduced cats or rats. And the, the anti-predator behavior I quantified is called flight initiation distance. And so that's the distance at which a prey item will allow a predator to approach. Uh, the distance at which a prey item will allow a predator to approach before it makes the decision to run. So as you go up the y-axis, you have larger flight initiation distance, which means the prey item will flee, make the decision to flee at a larger distance. So it's increased anti-predator behavior. Whereas if you go down the y-axis, what you have is the prey will allow the predator to get closer. So you have a shorter flight initiation distance, which means decreased anti-predator behavior. So on the left, you have your two pristine islands and the four islands with the presence of house cats and rats on the right. And what we see is a sort of baseline level of flight initiation distance or anti-predator behavior on the pristine islands. And what I found was uh, on the islands that have the presence of, house of invasive mammalian predators is that the finches have higher anti-predator uh, anti behavior. So the finches on these islands with the presence of invasive predators have adapted by increasing their anti-predator behavior. So the question then becomes though, well, what happens when you remove those predators? And we can ask this question because we know that on two of the islands, the park has successfully eradicated house cats and black rats. And what this means is that it can ask, it, there's some potentially inter interesting questions to ask here, because one of the questions is, is this response purely plastic or is it potentially evolved? If it was a purely plastic response and there's a cost associated with increased anti-predator behavior, once you remove the predators, I would predict that anti-predator behavior would revert back to sort of the baseline levels at the pristine islands. But if this behavior is potentially evolved, then the increased anti-predator would be maintained even after you've removed the predators. And so what I found is that on the islands that have successfully eradicated mammals, increased flight initiation distance or increased anti-predator behavior has been maintained. Now the islands were eradicated in 2003 and 2008, and these data were collected between 2016 and 2018. And the generation time for Darwin's finches is one year. So I would argue that enough time and enough generations have passed that if this was a purely plastic response, it, could, it should have reverted to the baseline levels that we observe on the pristine islands. Now, the one thing that I cannot rule out is the possibility of learned behavior or cultural transmission of this increased flight initiation distance through time. So do finches behaviorally respond to invasive predators? It appears they do by increasing their anti-predator behavior and that this increase in anti-predator behavior is maintained, is maintained uh, even once you've removed the predators. And so for the final human influence I would like to talk to you about is urbanization. 
And if you saw Ruth Rifkin's PhD award talk, you saw some of the excellent work that focused on the effects of urbanization on plant finch interactions. And I highly suggest watching her talk as well as all the other excellent PhD award talks. And they can all be found on the CSEE YouTube channel that you're watching right now. So I was interested in how finches might be behaviorally responding to urbanization. Because as to remind you, there's been a, a exponential increase in the permanent human population, which means there's been an increase in the urbanization to support these permanent human populations. And we can make two potential predictions. The first is maybe that in urban areas, because there's a high abundance of resources, there might be a high density of predators, and then you would have an increase in anti-predator behavior. Conversely, in urban areas, you have a large number of stimuli. So maybe something like habituation will happen and you'll have decreased anti-predator behavior. And so these are the data that I have already presented to you. And on the four islands that have urban populations in which I can do urban, non-urban comparisons, the data that I presented to you in regards to the invasive predators were all non-urban sites. So those data were collected not uh, at, at, non, at a separate population than the urban populations. And so what we found is that in general, urban finches have lower anti-predator behavior or shorter flight initiation distance compared to their non-urban counterparts. Now there's a couple of interesting things with this plot. The first is that the islands are ordered from left to right in terms of permanent population size. So Florian is the smallest with a permanent human population of about 150 people. Isabella has about 2000 and Santa Cruz at the largest has 12,000. Now this difference between urban and non-urban finches is not significant in Floriana, but it is significant in Isabella. So this suggests that there's an urbanization threshold in which case the difference between urban and non-urban finches will come to the forefront, but that it's a very small threshold since Isabella is only 2000 people. The other thing that's interesting is that the, the urban finches have flight initiation distances that are lower than the populations that are found on islands that have had no exposure to invasive predators or to humans. And the reason this is interesting is because what it suggests is that urbanization can strongly counteract any adaptations to invasive predators on these particular items, on, on these particular islands to the point that the anti-predator behavior is reduced to levels below what you find on pristine islands. So do finches behaviorally respond to urbanization? It appears they do in terms of decreasing the anti-predator behavior, which means that urbanization likely this result in this result of lower anti-predator behavior is likely the result of habituation. Now, I do have a confession to make. All these data were collected with myself or a field assistant as the simulated predator. And I've been going on about invasive house cats and all these sorts of things. And you may very rightly say, well, Kyoko, I'm sorry, you really don't look like a cat. And to that, I say, fair enough. So I tried to get a cat, but I couldn't. So I did the next best thing, which was I got a fake cat. So I'd like to introduce you to Bartolome, uh, my stuffed cat. And as you can see, Bartolome can't move. So to get him mobile, I strapped him to a remote control vehicle and I use this as the simulated predator. So if you are wondering what the cat is seeing, up here is a Darwin's finch. And this is the cat approaching and the finch flies away. And then you put a marker where the finch was, you put a marker where the stimulus is and you measure the distance. And so that's the great thing about flight initiation distance. And if you're curious what the finch sees, so on the left are the data that we collected with a human stimulus and on the right are the data that we collected with a cat. And what you can see is that the patterns and differences in urban, uh, I should mention also, this is again, urban and non-urban comparisons on the islands that have urban and non-urban populations of finches. And the patterns uh, between urban and non-urban um, pop populations as well as among islands is comparable. So I feel I am justified in making my inferences about invasive predators and adaptation to invasive predators, even though the data were collected with the human stimulus. And so today what I've showed you is that it appears that finches preferentially feed on human foods uh, when given a choice in areas where human foods are available. And we don't know why this is though, because it doesn't appear that the Darwins have a taste preference for any of these human type of foods, except in one area where there's a slight preference for bitter foods. 
We know that these different diets have an effect on the gut microbiome bacterial diversity. And we know that finches behaviorally, behaviorally respond to invasive predators as well as to urbanization. So what I hope I've shown you today is that humans are definitely having an influence on the Galapagos Islands in terms of adaptation and evolution. And as I said before, every time we go down there, we might answer one question and all it does is uh, open up more. And so hopefully I'll be able to continue researching humans and their influences on adaptation in Darwin's finches. Now this year I was in the field when the pandemic was declared. And so my colleagues and I ended up basically being stranded on San Cristobal and the Galapagos for six weeks. And then we finally were alerted to some humanitarian and repatriation flights. And so for me, I have an epic eight day saga uh, chronicled um, on this blog on how to get home during a pand pandemic from Galapagos to Canada. So if you're interested, you can read it at the Eco Evo Evo Eco Blogspot website. I'd like to thank again CSEE for the opportunity to tell you about my research and share my research with you. I'm just sorry that we're not able to do this in person in Edmonton and hopefully we will see you though at the next CSEE conference next year. I'd like to thank all of my funding sources as well as all of the people who have assisted me in the field and with ideas. This award is as much for everyone who's ever helped me as it is for me as well. And before I take questions, I'd like to address two things. The first is mental health and the second is racism. We are in the middle of a pandemic and it's created unprecedented times for all of us in the sciences. It is easy to forget to care for your own mental health. Please reach out to your peers and colleagues. If you can, listen and provide support and resources. Science is hard enough without everything that's going on in the world and it's imperative that we support each other. Furthermore, both the pandemic and its disproportionate impacts on communities of color and the turmoil following the recent murders of Ahmed Arbery, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor have had significant emotional impacts on people of color. To even begin to understand what underrepresented people are experiencing, we must also talk about racism. This is a recent illustration from The New Yorker, which I think aptly encompasses what many people might be experiencing. Exhaustion from learning about systemic racism is very real. If you are exhausted, Remember that black, indigenous, people of color and underrepresented groups live their whole lives with this exhaustion. But this is not just an American thing. This is also a Canadian problem. Systemic racism exists in Canada and in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Furthermore, systemic racism exists in science and academia. Consider the lived experiences of underrepresented minorities in the science and academia. To read about the realities Black, Indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ+, and other underrepresented scientists face on a regular basis, you can start with this non-existent list of hashtags. The Black and the Ivory hashtag is infuriating. Hearing the daily micro and macro transgressions that people of color and underrepresented minorities endure in science and academia is enraging and heartbreaking. And to those of you who say, but it's about the science, I say you cannot have science without diversity. You cannot have science without an institution that welcomes, supports, and amplifies Black, Indigenous people of color, LGBTQ, and other underrepresented people. If you think you can focus on science without focusing on systemic racism in science, you're being part of the problem. Do not be the problem, be the solution. It is not enough for us to be non-racist. We must be actively anti-racist. We are facing a colossal battle to dismantle systemic racism in Canada, in science and in academia, and it will take a lot of work. Dismantling systemic racism in our institutions starts by locating it and changing it within ourselves. Ask yourself the hard questions and be more than non-racist, be anti-racist. I'm extremely proud of the Canadian Society for Ecology and Evolution who's at the forefront, doing more than just issuing token solidarity statements and actually doing things like introducing actionable initiatives to make science and academia more accessible and inclusive. Together, we must each do our part to create a country, a world, and an institution that is welcoming and supportive of those who have been marginalized and ignored for too long. Now, once we do that, we can confront the other problems in academia, such as why it's so hard to get a tenure track position, especially in the middle of a pandemic. I'd like to again thank the CSAE for this opportunity to thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyoko. Incredible talk. And thank you so much for addressing such important issues at the end as, as well. Um, 
I'm really glad you took some time to talk about that. Um, and we're always happy to have those discussions at, for, as part of the CSE. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in as well. Um, there are a lot of questions, a lot of applause in the chat for you, uh, Kyoko. So I'll start to relay some of those. Um, the first question is uh, related to the taste trial, pref uh, taste trial experiments, I guess. Um, wondering, do finches see color? Were taste trials, uh, were taste types randomized among colored cups between trials? So that's a great question. Yes, they do. The most birds have a uh, tetrachromatic vision, which is really cool. So they can see UV. So what we did, which I didn't mention, I just sort of mentioned the taste results. We actually ran trials uh, before with only neutral pastry to determine if there was a color preference uh, for certain types of colors. Because previous work has found that finches avoided, I think it was blue food. But uh, where, so what they did was they actually like took the pastry and dyed the pastry and then, and, or dyed seeds and then put them out in front of the finches. So in this particular case, we took the sort of tan neutral colored pastry, put them in colored cups with, and, and all the cups had no taste. And then we ran trials that way first. And there was no, um, we didn't find any evidence for any color preferences. So anything that we are finding with the taste trials does appear to be more associated with uh, the taste as opposed to the color. But yes, that's a, that's a good question. Awesome. Uh, thank you. And I'll ask if you could get out of your screen sharing as well, then um, that would be awesome. Um, next question up, uh, do finches closer to human settlements have a higher diversity of pathogens? I ask because I imagine that human towns can house globe-trotting germs, which might locally evolve to jump into fauna. That's a really great. That's a really great question, and I don't know. Um, I wish my colleague Sarah Canuti were here. She uh, focuses a lot on uh, disease ecology uh, in Darwin's finches, and so she would probably have a better answer. I, I'm trying. I know some work has been done on parasitism and parasites, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to recall the, re the results at the moment. I think there is a difference in diversity between or, you know, urban and non-urban finches in terms of parasites. But I don't know if that's in relation to simply different environments and different diets, or if that's in relation to us humans actually bringing the pathogens over. We have brought over some pretty nasty invasive parasites. There's a lot of work going on the invasive house fly, the uh, Florinus downsi, uh, because their larvae get into the nests of the finches and then they burrow into the nares or into the nostrils of the nestlings and uh, you can get uh, really high mortality rates. Uh, so we have brought over some really nasty um, parasites for sure, but I, I, I'll have to get back to you for all the details on that. Thanks. Or, well, I should say not thank you for bringing those nightmarish uh, parasites <laughs> to <your> attention. <laughs> um, next question. Wondering if different levels of predation could explain why the anti-predator behavior is higher in one of the eradicated islands. Is it possible that predation intensity varies? In general, no, because there's so few predators. So you were probably thinking of the one island where they were eradicated, where it's much higher. So the interesting thing about that particular island is actually that it's the island where the airport is. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot, even though there are uh, no house cats or black rats on the island anymore, there are um, big airplanes um, flying in and out. And I don't know if that has anything to do with it. In general, on that one particular island, all the animals were much more skittish than um, than on other islands. My colleague and I, we when we would be looking for a finch to chase, the land iguanas would run into their burrows from meters and meters away. And then when you go onto one of the pristine islands on Santa Fe, you practically step on them because they just don't move. So the, the difference between the islands and the overall anti-predator behavior, it wasn't just the finches, it was also the other animals on that particular island. Now, the causes of it, I don't know. Um, that would be really cool to go there and try and sort that out, um, yeah, in the future. Awesome, yeah. That's really cool to know it's not just the finches, it's like everything else as well, potentially. Yeah, but also in relation to that question, the, the, there's um, basically only a handful of endemic predators. So there's um, owls and hawks, and I think the snakes are known to um, depredate the juveniles, I think. 
but in general, that's it in terms of predators. So it's not like on the mainland where or or like in the guppy system where you have a, a, a gradation of predation levels, basically uh, based on the diversity and the numbers uh, or abundance of um, predators. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is the reduced anti-predator behavior seen in urbanized areas a question of habituation or could it be greater risk-taking behavior? i.e. are the finches more used to predators or more willing to risk predators for the foraging benefits? So that's a really great question. Um, the hard part with those questions is how do you discern what's boldness versus what's habituation versus, uh, and, and so that would, that would require some actually uh, really cool um, experiments to, to sort of tease those apart. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. The, it's, in previous work that's been done on various urban, non-urban comparisons, there's a lot of, um, it, the results have been, it's, it's both. It's a combination of habituation, it's a combination of bolder. So in general, urban uh, birds are, I think, bolder and more neophilic uh, and less neophobic. So, you know, they, they, they are more likely to go explore new objects uh, as opposed to the, the rural birds. So then the question then becomes, of course, well, is it is our is that a selection uh, filtering selection process of the urbanization, or is it because these types of birds are attracted to urban areas, or you, you know, so so that that's also stuff that's um, research that's been looked at in terms of urban non-urban comparisons, and um, um, yeah, so I so I I don't know the answer is the short answer to a very long answer, sorry. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, another question, uh, I wonder if there is an effect of human settlement size on food, on human food preference, i.e. evolution from human food preference in small villages uh, or only in bigger urban centers. So that's a great question and that's something we're hoping to do. So the, the human food preferences was done on only one island and we're trying to get to replicate it on all four of the towns. Uh, because yes, you're right. The, the really cool thing about the doing urban, non-urban comparisons on the Galapagos, which Ruth um, alluded to or spoke about in her talk, was that the four, uh, the four populations vary in population size. So your smallest one's 150, your largest one is 12,000. And the infrastructure to support that differs as well. So the amount of impervious cover, um, vegetation, um, ornamental plants, um, those sorts of things, they vary among those four populations. And so we've been really keen to try and repeat the cafeteria experiments on all four islands. And right now it's just a matter of logistics. So hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do it. Awesome, we look forward to it. Um, another question also related to the food. Um, have, humans changed, have humans changed the amount or the distribution of natural food plants in addition to introducing new foods? Yes, we have. We, not in the remote areas and not on the pristine islands, but in the urban areas, we've definitely changed things around. You, um, we have, and again, it'll depend on the town. So it'll depend on the island. So for instance, um, I, I, would, I would assume, I, don't, I can't think of any study that's actually quantified it, but I would assume that for instance, the vegetation in Floriana will be less impacted than let's say Porta Iora. Um, Flor the town in Floriana still has dirt roads. It doesn't have paved roads. And I don't, th I think they finally put in their first stop sign. Um, uh, or maybe not. But anyways, um, they have, um, yeah, so yes, I would expect that humans have changed the distribution and abundance of the uh, plants that the finches are supposed to be eating. Um, because I'm just thinking, so like on the pathway to the Charles Darwin Research Station, it's covered in the types of foods that the, the finches are supposed to be eating. But then in town, because of the impervious concrete, you've got a lot less of it. Uh, you got a lot less cacti for nesting and that sort of stuff actually in town, but it does vary from town to town. Okay. Um, and similarly, to what extent do differences in density or abundance of habitats between island, uh, to what extent could they drive patterns as well? Density of habitat? Yeah, or of different um, density or abundance of different habitats, I guess. Uh, okay, so 
that's a good question because there are different habitats on different islands. The larger islands, the larger newer islands have a highland area um, where it's cooler and moister and like the species distribution will be different. So on Santa Cruz, you have a lot more uh, warbler finches and small tree finches up in the highland areas than you do uh, where we do most of our work, which is in the lowland arid areas where we've got more of the ground finches and cactus finches. So is the question, how does the habitat distribution affect? Um, I guess, does it or could it? Um, yeah. Could it drive some of the observed patterns? And to what extent do you think it might? So it, it yeah, okay. Uh, yes, yes, it could drive some of the observed patterns. For most of my particular work, we tend to only work in the arid lowland areas. And then the town towns themselves are usually, um, because they're on the coast, they're also lowland arid areas. I haven't done any work where um, we've compared anti-predator behavior or food preferences, let's say, in the highlands or the lowlands. And that would be something that'd be really quite interesting, because yes, I would expect that habitat and different types of habitat could potentially drive behavioral uh, differences be, uh, between different populations of finches. Cool, thank you. Um, we'll get a couple more questions if that's all right. Um, uh, this one is wondering, have you considered running similar tests in agricultural areas um, as well as urban or isolated sites? That's a good question. And yes, I'd like to. Um, It'll be interesting too, because what it'll, it'll be slightly confounded because the ag agricultural areas are usually in the highland areas because that's where there's more water. So um, the good thing though, is that there's usually a transition zone. So it would be interesting to do sort of lowland area, the transition, agricultural, and then highland. And so that would be something that would be really quite interesting, um, uh, quite interesting to look at. So yeah, maybe hopefully in the future. <laughs> I think you have so much to do still. This is really awesome. <laughs> Um, second last question, um, do you know anything about the flavor profile of the finch's local foods that might explain the results of the pastry experiment? I do not. My colleague Luis de Leon, I know, has, I believe, tried most of the finch foods. <laughs> um, because they are mostly plant-based, um, I would imagine they're probably on the vegetal side. And, and But th that being said, we do know that a lot of, not just the cactus finches, but the ground finches will also do things like drink nectar out of the apuntia, which I'm going to assume is going to be on the sweeter side. Um, and um, uh, and the finches also eat invertebrates when uh, it's when they're around and, and abundant. And so, um, and I don't know what the profile of invertebrates are. Um, so no, I don't know very much about the flavor profiles of the local foods. And um, but that's a little bit where the taste preference experiment came out was because maybe there's, they have a propensity for sweet and salty foods or, or, or foods that they don't get to normally taste because they're more rare or something like that. Um, you know, it's kind of like us humans, we really like our salty and fatty foods, but that's, you know, there's an evolutionary reason for that. So. Um, so, so yeah, so I don't know, I guess we can go back and start chomping on the seeds. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up for that one. That sounds great. <laughs> um, and we'll give you one more question. Um, this one is wondering, could the preference for human food be related to as continuous higher abundance versus natural food or to the greater energy levels finches get for it? Um, so that yeah, that's a good question. Um, we've done some work on the energetics of the foods they're supposed to be eating versus the human foods. Um, in terms of abundance, that is a very that is a big possibility, especially in the urban areas. It's a lot easier. You know, the restaurants are always going to have people there, whereas um, you know, in the dry season and and, and all year round, whereas in the dry season, it's going to be a lot harder to find the foods that you're supposed to be eating. So. I mean, we've done walking transects where we look at what the finches are eating in town versus out of town, so where they have a choice. And we find the more the, in town, they tend to feed on more types of food. So there's so they're feeding on the foods they're supposed to eat and they're feeding on the human foods. Um, so there's a greater diversity of foods in the um, 
urban areas. So it might be, it, it could very well be linked to abundance, but that's why we did the experiment to see, you know, if they've got both right in front of them, which one are they gonna go for? Mm -hmm. um, so it could be that abundance has, is part of the why they prefer, um, uh, part of the answer to why they prefer human foods. Um, but I, we haven't done anything experimentally to look at that or, or quantify that. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, some fantastic questions and some even more fantastic answers. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, thank you all for posting so many applause emojis and saying great talk and very cool, much appreciated. Um, so Kyoko, thank you so much. You've done a fantastic job. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, like Dr. Katanda mentioned, um, if you want to rewatch the talk or if you want to watch um, last week's uh, also very incredible early career award talk by Dr. Diana Renison, then that and all the PhD award talks from this year are all on the YouTube channel. Um, so you can click our CSE logo underneath the video and you'll be able to see all the videos um, under the videos tab of our channel. So please check those out if you're interested. Um, otherwise, thank you uh, for tuning in for this series. Um, I hope we can all see you in uh, Vancouver 2021 for the next CSE annual meeting. Um, and with that, goodbye.